Hey, welcome back everybody for the last session of the day. Thanks for tuning in and staying with us so far. Uh, I'm joined here with Dean, uh, Dean Samuels, and we're gonna talk today a little bit about some of the overall interesting things about machine learning, but we're also gonna have some interesting live demos here today. Yeah, yeah absolutely, a lot of uh, cool things to, to finish off on. I think uh, the day itself has been quite uh, informational for, uh, for a lot of people, uh, but you know, we um, have saved some interesting things to last, so I'm excited to see what we're gonna cover today. Exactly, exactly. And I think one of the key themes today was really the ability or to use AWS to really make machine learning happening, right? And our mission, we talked about that a lot, about our mission being, you know, making it available for any IT professional and developer on any kind of different layer. Uh, Dean, what was uh, what was your interest today so far about all the different sessions that we had? Yeah, it's a really interesting you mentioned that about putting uh, machine learning in the hands of every developer. Um, one of the key learnings I saw is that we do have uh, AI and machine learning technology that caters for everyone. Yeah. Whether you are that um, hardcore machine learning specialist, whether you're that uh, developer who might not have that machine learning experience, or even if you're an end user, um, being able to integrate a lot of these AI and ML services into your applications to build more intelligent applications yeah. is quite seamless. You know, I really enjoyed the sessions talking about some of the artificial intelligence services where customers don't have to worry about the training and the models and everything else. They just need to know how to make an API call. Uh, of course, no, not all customers would like that. They want a bit more customization um, uh, uh, on their side. You know, can you tell yeah. us a little bit about maybe some of the other layers here? Absolutely, uh, Dean. I just flashed up here the three different layers that we often talk about, and you address the kind of AI services. I think the middle layer is really interesting. I mean, we had some exciting sessions today about SageMaker, but I really want to call out the ability to use the platform by just bringing your data and then leveraging the algorithm, the machine learning algorithms that Amazon provides you with and train machine learning models without the need to actually ever write a line of code for that machine learning algorithm itself. Right. So you're just doing sort of the, the, the training of the data, the data labeling yourself, and then SageMaker will take everything. Care of everything. Ab absolutely, and if you think about that, I mean, we extended the platform a little bit over reInvent last year. Mm. Uh, we now have a marketplace for machine learning, for example, which is really great because it allows us to actually use algorithm that other developers or other companies are publishing out there to the marketplace that we can now use that are very specific to specific kind of use cases or industries, et cetera, and we can just start using them without the need to actually build those. Uh, you mentioned annotating data, right? We launched SageMaker Ground Truth. We had a session about that earlier that really helps with intelligent labeling of data before we go into the training. So you see that the overall platform services really help us to say, if I have data available, I want to build my own machine learning models, right? Because maybe the services, the top layer services are not exactly suited for my use case. I can still build machine learning models without the need to actually understand the underlying, underlying models and frameworks, et cetera. Yeah, it's really all about that choice, isn't it? So having that choice, a variety of the different uh, technologies to address the typical business needs. Uh, you know, you mentioned about Ground Truth. Another really interesting announcement we had made uh, at reInvent was the Amazon StageMaker Neo. Yeah. So you can imagine that time it takes to really train, a data, tra train the model with yeah. the, uh, the various amounts of data. And then you want to deploy that model to different platforms, you know, your ARM-based processes, your x86-based, whatever it might, yeah. that might be. Imagine if you have the ability to train that data once, but deploy to many platforms. Well, that's what Amazon SageMaker Neo yeah. does. So it's all about that choice, but then also continuing on with that ease of use, right? Absolutely. So, and I think you, you make a good point about overall agnosticism to the platforms that you might be using, and the need where you deploy the models out. But the same thing also holds true if you say, okay, you know, maybe I'm a data scientist, and I want to use a very specific framework mm. that I feel comfortable with. Uh, you see at the bottom layer here, really, you know, we're, we, we have a few frameworks listed here, but you can freely choose between the frameworks that you want to use to build your own machine learning model if you feel comfortable using those frameworks, no matter if it's a MaxNet, Cafe, PyTorch, TensorFlow. Not only do we support those frameworks on the platform, but we actually optimize the underlying EC2 infrastructure uh, and hypervisors and, and kernel libraries that we load up into those images to better perform in both training but also prediction uh, of those models. Yeah, and, and actually just on that, you know, one of the, there's sometimes a, uh, a misunderstanding around uh, having to train, do the training of, for, for the modeling, you need this 
high spec uh, type machines. You know, sometimes that's not always the case. So we've had some really great announcements around things like Amazon Elastic Inference, Absolutely, which yeah. allows you to take some of your more uh, traditional um, EC2 instances that you might use, whether it's in things like the C5s or M series, but essentially where you can actually attach these GPUs to these type of uh, instances to do all your training where you build the train and then you deploy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and especially also in the inference in that specific scenario, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the uh, use cases we had a lot of customers ask about, they say, you know, uh, I train on a big GPU instance, that's totally fine, but what if I just want to make predictions, yeah. right? And based on my web traffic or my application traffic, I don't need the full spectrum. Yeah. And that's where the elastic inference comes in really, really handy, because mm -hmm. I just attach a, a small kind of GPU capability to it, which I can remove at any point. Uh, and really scale it to only my needs to the half. Uh, we also announced some other interesting, exciting uh, a new uh, movement here in the chipset. So we announced AWS Inferentia, specific chipset for machine learning and some new specific instances to really give you the freedom of choice of no matter if you want to use any kind of different framework, uh, bring down the cost of training, inference, maybe just choose the platform services or opt in for that high level AI services. So, so I guess with all of this availability of technology, of hardware, of frameworks and things, this is why you commonly say that AI and machine learning is the new normal, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I think it's just the availability is, is so given, right? And the, the ability to do it cost effective in a cloud environment with potentially no machine learning expertise required really makes it accessible to everyone. Absolutely. And talking about that, you know, I mentioned like frameworks are really just for data scientists. That's not quite what I said, but I said if I'm a data scientist, I might choose a framework. Sure. But I think you wanted to talk about a little use case of a prototype that has been built with MXNet, right? Yeah, absolutely. This has actually been a really fascinating customer story uh, that, uh, that we've uh, come across. Um, it's actually a customer that uh, presented at uh, reInvent uh, 2018, end of last yeah. year. Um, Chick-fil-A. Um, so for those of you not familiar, Chick-fil-A is essentially a uh, fast food. Um, uh, restaurant uh, fr or franchise, uh, you know, as you can see on the screen, provides your traditional sort of um, uh, chicken burgers and French fries and, and so on. Um, the interesting take for, that I got from their session is um, they have, they're very innovative. Um, they've got actually a dedicated innovation center. And what they wanted to do is run a series of experiments to get some experience with artificial intelligence and machine learning. They weren't too sure exactly in terms from a business perspective um, mm -hmm. what they wanted to achieve, but they just want to understand the technology and that would open up the doors to other areas where they could potentially use ML and AI in, uh, in other areas. And yep. basically what they did with the prototype is they set up an environment that would actually identify when French fries that have actually already been cooked right. are in the um, storage location for longer than what they call the whole time. Right. And right. so essentially what they want to do is ensure that they're not serving customers old french fries because yeah. that's a bad customer experience, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so using um, image analysis, uh, image and video an uh, analysis, uh, they wanted to uh, check when certain fries exceeded that hold time so they could actually remove it from that storage location. Yeah. Um, it was quite interesting for me to, uh, to read about this and, and view it because it was actually a set of uh, students, um, uh, university students that actually implemented this type of uh, um, solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they actually used a series of, uh, of those frameworks, uh, actually Apache MXNet mm -hmm. um, on infrastructure to uh, do the build, the training, and then the deployment. I uh, yep. won't go into too much detail in terms of the underlying hardware and everything else they set up. Um, there's actually a YouTube video um, on uh, Chick-fil-A's uh, uh, implementation of uh, this particular solution. So I highly recommend you, you check that out. It goes into a lot of detail. But mm -hmm. the, the real uh, takeaway from that is they were able to actually understand and get learnings from deploying this type, building and deploying this type of model in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, they can now identify other areas of the business where uh, image and video analysis will actually be quite useful, whether it's yeah. around body movements around the restaurant, so you can imagine some of the use cases there, you know, making sure certain you know, hygiene is, is kept up to a high standard. Yeah. People uh, washing example. their hands exactly. and things like that, yeah, right? Absolutely, yeah. you know, being able to introduce things like kiosk using um, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality for their customers. Um, but really optimizing that customer experience. So it was really interesting. Very interesting. And, and one thing for me that struck me was that actually the entire uh, team that worked on that mm. had no experience of machine learning exactly beforehand, right. yep. never used the framework and kind of just kicked it off, which is, which is really great. It shows how accessible it is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think one of the students actually had, only had a month's experience of Python and yeah. was able to, uh, to build this out. There we go. Yeah. Python so. for our watchers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's really putting the hands of uh, AI into every... And uh, right? Dean, yeah. I know you, you, you're a 
rugby player, right? As we all see here, right? But I, I think you retired. 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 Okay. Okay. The mind's in it. The body's not. <laughs> You brought a little story for with us here also from the National Football League, which is not yeah. quite rugby, yeah, but yeah. you know, well, you tell like us a little bit about that. There the, we go. The, the big boys. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, this was actually also a very interesting um, a story from uh, NFL, the National Football mm -hmm. League um, in, the, in the US. A, a, a customer of ours who've actually um, put something into production using uh, their next generation stats or next gen stats um, uh, offering. And essentially what it would do is it really changes the viewing experience. So you think about NFL, um, mm. uh, the US's top sport, um, yeah. they typically get a viewing audience of over 20 million for right. certain uh, certain games. So they need to think of ways of how to really uh, ch enhance that viewing experience for, uh, for people at home. Yeah. And so one of the things they actually looked at is why not provide an, a, uh, a service which can predict the probability of completion rates, meaning right. when the quarterback throws the ball, um, what's the probability that the receiver is going to catch it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so actually they were very similar to uh, uh, Chick-fil-A where mm. they had a lot of deep developer expertise but yeah. not so much machine learning right. uh, expertise. And so they actually turned to AWS and specifically um, Amazon SageMaker mm -hmm. um, to actually uh, build and train their model that they could actually deploy to the various stadiums that can provide that near real-time predictions of completion rates when the quarterback uh, throws that ball. Very interesting. One of the interesting things with this, though, when we talk about machine learning and, and training, training it, we, we typically think about this vast amount of data. Yeah. In the NFL's case, they actually only dealt with three terabytes worth of okay. data. Okay, yeah. Now, that might seem like a very small amount, uh, but if you put into perspective the um, the 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 play-by-play -play stats and what they also call the box score stats that they've collected over probably the last 80 to 90 years since mm -hmm, 1920. Mm -hmm. um, what they're collecting now for the training data far exceeds that. Right. Um, so they were actually able to use that three terabytes, essentially three years worth of data, to build uh, or to train an effective model that could actually then provide that um, uh, that probability rating based on a whole variety of things. Um, the quarterback's position, who was mm -hmm. defending against the quarterback, where the receivers were standing, um, what, was the form, what was the formation, where the players are on the field. Yep. Essentially what they had is these RFID chips in the players, even in the footballs, so they can actually measure things like the distance that the, the ball is being thrown, where yeah. the quarterback is positioned. So um, I, I believe the study is that every one-tenth of a second, each player is sending back their XY coordinate on the football field there of where go. they are. And basically it's uh, computing all of that information to give that probability score that you saw in the video. Very, very interesting. Yeah. And another good example of really seeing how does things mold together, you know, tags, connectivity, scale, mm. bringing it back. And one interesting thing is we talked about frameworks, I'm maxing that with Chick-fil-A. We talked about the platform service here yep. with Amazon SageMaker. Um, let's have a look at some of these AI services, mm. the higher level services. Uh, there's another customer called AWS, which yep. is a customer there of AWS. <laughs> Our uh, uh, actual team in Korea, and you can see that on the video here on the slideshow here, uh, used our Amazon recognition service to do facial recognition on the signups for our AWS summit in Korea in, in Seoul. And the idea was, you know, instead of queuing up and showing your ID and finding your name uh, to get your badge to be able to enter our summit area, uh, you would use facial recognition. There's small little uh, uh, curb proxies there, little booths where you step to it and uh, you look into the camera, it recognizes your face. If you recognize your face correctly, uh, you can just print your batch out straight then and there. And this is a good example of something that didn't require any machine learning expertise. Mm, yeah. So uh, some of our internal uh, developers who built this here in Korea, they basically just had to pluck the APIs together and, and make it look slick here print it out and that was end of story without the need to understand the, the underlying machine learning Absolutely, technology. and you can think about, again, comes down to that customer experience, right? If you're an attendee to an event like AWS Summit, the last thing you want to be doing is waiting in a queue for a long period of time. You want to get out there and network and see the um, various demos and booths and, and, and so on. So being able to uh, register yourself and get your badge through these kiosks, essentially, that allows us to scale quite dramatically. And we've actually rolled this out to other summits. I think New York Summit, they actually yeah, used, it, yeah. uh, used it as well. So hoping to see more of that uh, in the future. Yeah, I like it always how we try things out, right? And yeah. we always tell our customers, 
go out there and build. And internally, we <laughs> encourage people to try prototype new ideas Absolutely. like this. We are right? a team of builders. Exactly, right? <laughs> team of builders. There we go. And so we talked about the different kind of layers of machine learning, but I just want to spend a little bit of time um, just on the kind of mm. types of machine learning that we see, right? And uh, you know, there are different kind of types. We often talk about supervised, unsupervised learning. If you're not familiar with those terms, supervised generally means that we need to take data that we annotate it beforehand, know the data, and then train the model on it. So if you look at those computer vision examples, yeah, right, with, those with would the Chick -fil -A, be Chick-fil-A, right? Yeah, and actually, just on the Chick-fil-A, it was interesting how they yeah. did it. So it was essentially 25,000 images that they used to do the training, the initial training uh, of the model. Now, they didn't obviously sit there and take 25,000 different pictures of uh, French fries. It's a lot of yeah. French fries, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but they actually had a pretty... Uh, must smart... be hungry. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Um, they had a pretty smart way of uh, doing it. They actually took video of uh, the, the French fries in different angles and actually used a green screen so they could actually impose a different background right. on those uh, set, of, uh, set of fries. So they did that a few times with different fries and then actually used uh, OpenCV to cut up that image, uh, that video into images mm -hmm. to uh, basically create those 25,000 images that they can then use to... to uh, different overlays. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, very that's interesting. That's an example of supervised yeah. learning. That's but that's still, take, that's still time consuming, Still right? takes yeah. time, right? Even though we enhance and enrich the data by techniques like this, like you mentioned, we still need to annotate. Maybe SageMaker Ground Truth would help here again to accelerate it, but it generally means that we need to annotate the data. We also have unsupervised learning, which is generally the ability to say, I try to find patterns in my data set without knowingly trying to point the model in a certain direction, mm -hmm. meaning we don't annotate the data set per se. Uh, a very common uh, unsupervised learning pattern is, for example, clustering your, your customer or user base. Mm -hmm. The key point here, though, is that you still need past performance data, right? You need a historical kind of data that you can use to you know, find certain patterns before we can build a model on top of it. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes we don't have the data available. Right. And in that case of scenario, um, there's a new space that's quite interesting. It's been around for a while, but we, it's really a lot more accessible lately, which is the space of reinforcement learning. You yeah. want to talk a little bit about that, Reed? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is really going to be a game changer, um, or it really is a game changer when it comes to um, uh, AI and machine learning and, mm -hmm. and, and the ability to do the, the training. It's essentially a series of trial and error uh, at yeah. the end of the day. So um, we'll go into more detail um, uh, shortly in terms of how it actually works. But at the uh, end of the day, it's essentially where you can have this model in a simulation environment that's learning on the go. Um, IDC actually said that you know, by 2027, um, supervised learning and reinforced um, uh, learning especially um, is really going to change the way that artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies will yeah. do on-the-job learning, will be self-aware essentially, and either can make the decisions themselves um, uh, during that learning process or provide that recommendation, mm -hmm. straight optimized recommendation um, to, to human beings. Right, right. So it's essentially uh, on, on the job learning, I guess you could say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you maybe talk more about the simulation environment and how that actually works? Absolutely, yeah. So if you look at reinforcement learning, the basic idea is, is that we have some form of scoring function that actually kicks off the reinforcement learning, meaning that we provide some reward or penalty to a certain activity. We say, this is good, this is bad, and then we let the model learn based on actions. Now the problem with actions is sometimes the actual physical world and the actions mm. would take a long time right. to learn it. So one of the other techniques that we find a lot in, in reinforcement learning is that the initial raw model that we want to train, we do it in a simulation environment. So we simulate certain environment, maybe cars, mechanical industries, environments, virtual realities, et cetera, yep. where we train that model based on that behavior. And then we have a first iteration of algorithm before we actually use it in the, in the physical environment. Right. And, and you find a, a lot of interesting use cases here, supply chain simulation, manufacturing processes, you know, what is good, what is bad robotics manipulation sure. and we're going to have a bit of robotics demo in just that, a yeah. <laughs> just a little bit about that autonomous cars so reinforcement learning is really useful um, but just to give you a bit of an idea what do i mean with you actually simulate something and a reward function so mm. i figured uh, wouldn't it be great to teach a machine to learn how to run without right. ever explaining how legs and things like that work yeah absolutely. right, Sounds good. right? Mm -hmm. and reinforcement learning is an interesting scenario here because we can use that uh, together with Amazon SageMaker reinforcement learning. So what I'm going to show you now uh, actually is power through SageMaker with the reinforcement learning uh, addition that we have. And, and so this means just on, on the SageMaker reinforcement learning. So this is uh, essentially a, a new feature, I guess you could say, that we uh, launched last year at reInvent. 
Um, so this provides what you mentioned before in terms of that simulation environment, the scoring uh, system, that's all integrated into, into SageMaker. Exactly, so uh, it, it's integrated into SageMaker. Again, we give you flexibility in what you want to use. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for example, Open Gym is one of the interesting uh, uh, projects there, but you can even use Sumerian, for example, as oh, a right. simulation okay. environment. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we give you flexibility yep. in, in, in how that would work. And so we use this new capability to say, uh, let's train train Harry, our little mm -hmm. stick man here, on uh, on how to run. And uh, so this was the first iteration. As you can see, this isn't quite running yet, right? Uh, the stickman just kind of falls down, doesn't know what to do with those yeah. limbs or anything. And you can see the video stopped. That's where all the initial iterations that they've done. Yep. So the idea now of reinforcement learning is how do I train the stickman how to run? I mm. cannot, I shouldn't tell him how running works, mm. uh, but I should tell him what is good and what is bad. So a, a reward and penalty function. Mm. So uh, a reward function would be, the, for example, the time that I keep myself up, where a penalty would be whenever I fall, that's bad, right? And now what we can do is we take that action, right, and, and look at the observation. Right. Is the observation I'm falling? Mm -hmm. Well, that's bad. Is the observation I'm staying a little bit longer? That's good. That's good and right. I keep doing those iterations over and over and over again. And if you keep doing that, if I sh show you the next video, after multiple iterations, Harry slowly learned that, well, if I put my lat forward here, then I kind of can stay longer. Mm -hmm. uh, not quite elegant yet. <laughs> and I certainly wouldn't call that running. No, no. Right? Certainly wouldn't call it running. But he's staying upright. The thing is staying but now we keep iterating on it, right? And another award function would be, for example, the distance that you travel while staying, uh, staying up, not falling, right? And so we keep iterating on top of that. So that first iteration, we take it, push it back to SageMaker, train it, take that model and reiterate in that right. simulation environment over that's and the over again. Loop that's constantly going, okay. Exactly. Right. So yeah. every time Harry falls, that's bad, etc. Okay. And we keep reinforcing it as such. And what you see now here after a variety of certain iterations, Harry, without ever us telling him how to run, managed to actively kind mm -hmm. of run. Right. Not the most elegant version sure. quite yet, but pretty impressive to think about the fact that we taught a machine to learn how to run without ever knowing what a lag is or limbo or muscle right. or how to put the foot forward, purely by just giving it sure. reward So you're functions. not coding for it all of these variances or anything, it's just basically learning as it goes along. Correct, correct. And obviously these reward functions, we can extend them to something more complex, yep. something specific to our use case. But the basic understanding and idea here is, is to say that we can go off with this very simple premise mm. and build a first iteration and then just keep iterating it in a simulation environment sure. so it can learn very quickly, because we do it in a cloud environment, can do that at massive scale, yeah, scale yep. right? And then we get a first model out uh, yep. in, as such. And you can have all these different parallel um, builds and training going at the same time, right, in the, in, in the cloud. Absolutely. And so, like, I noticed Harry did run off the track there, so you, you could actually, the next iteration could be, you know, staying Rewarding on track. Rewarding it to stay on track, track. absolutely. And right. we saw earlier, and if you joined the session of Deep Racer, mm -hmm. how, uh, how some of that also works in terms of Keeping your car on the line. That was a good example right. of using a reward function with reinforcement learning mm -hmm. in exactly in exactly that manner. Right. And so, um, you know, I mentioned robotics. Yep. Uh, robotics is an interesting space, and uh, you know, reinforcement learning being used in the robotics space uh, at reInvent last year in 2018. We also announced a service called uh, AWS. Robomaker. And the idea here is, is that we want to make it easy for anyone to develop, test, and deploy uh, basically intelligent robotics applications uh, out there. Um, we also contribute to the robot operating system, which is a strong component and part of the AWS Robomaker service itself, too. Right. Okay. And so I figure, you know, um, why don't we try that out in, in a live demo, right? Okay. Try to understand what is ROS, the robot operating system, what is RoboMaker, how do we simulate something, uh, what are some of the ways of actually interacting with that using the robot operating system uh, message bus. Yeah, absolutely. And, so, um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I was fun watching uh, uh, Harry learn how to run, but it was yeah. in that simulation environment. So you want to see the real deal? I want to see the real all deal. Right, I want right. to see this in action. So, you know, I, with me here, I brought actually a, a turtle bot, the turtle bot tree burger, which is really great. Uh, project if you want to learn a little, bit, a little bit about robotics, so you get it in a box. It's not assembled like this yet, uh, but you will assemble it yourself. But it comes with a few uh, components. So generally inside you see there's a Raspberry Pi actually that's attached to it. There's an OpenCR board that controls a bunch of actuators, which are the wheels here. 
Uh, and then most interestingly also here on top, and you'll see in a little bit, I'll turn it on and it will start spinning. Uh, this is actually a, a LIDAR, right? So it's a, a laser sensor, so it keeps scanning the environment for objects and see how far they are away. And what that allows us to do, it allows us to do what is called SLAM, simultaneous location, uh, localization and mapping, right? So we try to understand the environment that we're in, try to understand it, draw a map out of it, and localize ourselves on that map using LIDAR sensors, right? right? Yep. And in addition to that, I thought it would be fun to also have a bit of a, a vision, so I attached a, a little USB camera here right, so uh, see what to, yep. to my Raspberry Pi. So let's start it off by me first and foremost powering up this little robot. So I'm going to switch over here uh, to my terminal first. And I'm going to launch um, uh, this using the robot operating system, ROS Launch, that has some launch files. Uh, it will power up some of the components here on my Raspberry Pi and will then connect to my robot operating system master. There's a bus where it exchange messages. And we can see now if we look closely, this uh, LiDAR sensor actually now started spinning and it now actively sends information back of this environment, what it senses here uh, to my master node. Right. So as a next step, what I could do is, for example, try to understand what we currently see. So if I bring uh, uh, bring back up a visualization tool, the Arvis visualization tool, we can see that our robot is now slowly trying to understand our room here. So this is mapping sort of the room. This is mapping the room. And you yeah. can see if I approach it, you can see that there are actually green dots mm -hmm. just next to it. So it tries to understand uh, the room right now. And you can see if I step a little bit beside here, I'm that little green dot here that moves around the robot. So that's how these uh, localization and mapping exercises work. Right. Now, why do we do that? Well, because we generally then want to learn from it and be able to navigate the robot around. Mm -hmm. So what we can do is do that mapping exercise in, in an environment. I build a little kind of little playground here oh, for our okay, robot right. in front of us. So how about I go ahead and actually stop this mapping exercise, take my robot, and place it uh, right in here into my environment. Now the next thing that I can do is I actually started um, mapping this out early and so I'm going to bring up Arvis again but with the map of that playground that I localized earlier. Right. And what I can do now I can say okay well my robot is in this corner which is the corner that you see sorry that you see here, mm -hmm. looking into this direction, right? So I can say, okay, I know that. So I initially position my robot using the pose estimation tool into that corner. Oh, okay. And now you can see that the actual mapping of my LiDAR sensor nicely matches basically that map that I previously uh, kind of have drawn out. If I want to fine tune this a little bit, I can maybe click it a little bit closer. But from here onwards on, LiDAR sensor should allow us to navigate that space around. So what I can do next is to give my robot now a navigational goal where it should go mm -hmm. in this environment by trying to understand its position right. Right, using the LiDAR sensor. So what if I say, how about you go into that corner over here and turn yourself back into a certain direction? And you can now see that the robot yeah, yeah. slowly starts moving if you look closer to the screen, you can see that there are green arrows. Mm -hmm. The green arrows are kind of the possible position where the robot thinks it is based on its current location and based on what it sees from the rest of the map. So I can keep navigating around. So I say go to that other corner again. It will use that LiDAR sensor information to roughly know where I'm at. It then calculates a map or a certain direction that it can go into and twist itself around. Right. So okay. pretty cool, pretty if, we, cool. If, yeah. if, if we think about that, that robot wasn't really never made aware of that mm -hmm. environment, but because it continuously maps that around, I can send it across and nicely navigate within the space. Let's try it one more time. Let's send it all the way over to there. Let's maybe uh, say, how about bringing it maybe all the way into the corner right over here? There we go. Right. So if we, if we change the structure and the layout of this um, uh, area, yeah, then it will just simply adapt 
to that new Correct. Format, formation. Correct. Right. Okay. As a matter of fact, <laughs> Dean, I yeah. brought a little structure with me. You did. I did, <laughs> right? So let's, um, let's change our structure around a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to give my robot now a certain maze that we have right over right. here. And now you can immediately see that already the live mapping information that we're getting is showing us that we now have a new angle here. So what I can do next is to say, okay, it looks like the map is changing, so let me re-explore and remap the entire environment. So let me try that out now. I'm going to just restart my mapping exercise with the mm -hmm. visualization tool. And you can now see that it yep. starts to create a new map. And if I now navigate my robot around, let me just control it myself for once here. Uh, if I turn the robot around a little bit, you can see that I can nicely make the robot go around. And if you look behind me, it will slowly start to update the map. So mm -hmm. as it goes around the corner now, you can see, oh, you I immediately identified there's a different kind of corner. So let yeah. me try to run through that maze uh, in full. So I navigated around. Looking good. There you go. Navigate, navigate. And we get around another corner again. And that other corner is again being seen by the LiDAR sensor. And let's map it around. Go a little bit around here, around the corner. Turn a little bit more. Turn around the corner here. Turn it back. And you can see the mapping yeah. exercise seems to work. So right. really cool in the way we can actually navigate in real time. Mm -hmm. And I don't even need to look at it because I see my coordinates now in real time yeah. on how we built that map. Mm -hmm. And even if I just look at the map here, I am in the corner and I am in the corner here. How cool is that? Yay! <laughs> Boom. Nice one. So two questions. Um, so number one, is this what uh, robot vacuum cleaners do? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So you find that, and as a matter of fact, we have a variety of our customers who mm. built these kind of appliances. If you haven't seen those vacuum cleaners that navigate around, they do exactly the same thing, right? So they try to understand the environment, continuously map it out, and plan their routes in those environment. Right. right. And you also mentioned DeepRacer before. Um, so what, what, I guess what's the difference between DeepRacer, which also uses reinforcement learning um, uh, through trial and error and, and reward, and what you have here? Yeah. So there are a variety of different uh, interesting things here. Uh, DeepRacer, for example, the idea is, is to primarily use computer vision, also to navigate the car around. So right. if you take off the hood of the DeepRacer, you see there's an actual camera. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this kind of scenario, uh, we actually have the laser sensor. So I don't yep. use the web cam necessarily, but mm -hmm. I use the, the laser sensor to kind of map that out. Right. Uh, what you'll find in, for example, self-driving cars or larger robots, they have multiple combinations sure. of all these different yep. sensors and computer vision to navigate itself around uh, effectively. Yep. Now, one other thing that I would say is, is, you know, you see those tools. I talked about RoboMaker. Okay, we have Arviz, ROS, the different tools that we have mm -hmm. here. Um, training this robot now how to drive this maze effectively would, would I would need to kind of do that multiple times, probably yep. multiple iterations, a lot of different iterations, mm -hmm. which I obviously can do with the physical robot here itself, but again, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> got to charge the batteries yeah, off, right? Right, right. So isn't it better if I do it in a simulation mm -hmm. environment? Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. So all the tools that I showed you here now run the robot operating system, but they were running on my laptop and on the Raspberry Pi itself, which is just to map this out. But what if I want to teach the robot really how to self-drive now? Well, I could do that in a simulation environment in my cloud environment. Mm -hmm. So if I just switch over here to my AWS console quickly, you can see that we now have the AWS RoboMaker in the console. And RoboMaker allows me to do a variety of different things. Uh, first and foremost, it has development environments where we can develop. We can uh, load the robot applications around. We can manage our fleet. So if I click on robots, uh, you can see, for example, my Turtle Bot Burger here, which is one of the robots mm -hmm. uh, that is ARM-based because yep. it's a Raspberry Pi here where I can deploy that out. So it helps with the development of that environment. It helps uh, with development of the robot application and also the deployment to it. I have one robot now here, mm -hmm. but realistically, again, if we talk scale with hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of robots out there, RoboMaker helps me to effectively manage my fleets Please. here and then obviously also manage my deployments that I potentially sent 
to mm. those fleets. You can see I did a few trials here. Some failed, some succeeded. That's right. exactly the expected behavior of being able to deploy that out. And this is the idea of having that sort of parallel um, simulation environment so where you're not restricted to one sort of maze that you've got here. You now can actually do multiple training concurrently um, uh, with uh, the different, uh, different devices. Exactly. Yeah. So that's what we would call simulation. So yeah. if I click on simulation jobs here, you can see that I can run multiple simulation jobs. As a matter of fact, I currently run, run simulation job with, uh, with a very basic kind of turtle bot program that just sends data to CloudWatch. But let me click on this for a second here, and you can see that it actually allows me to use the same tools that i just shown you here in my laptop, which is the suite of the robot operating system, right. so RQT, RViz, and the terminal with it, uh, but also a simulation environment where we can choose Gazebo, for example, which is one of the most commonly right. used here, mm -hmm. to simulate an environment and then use the same tools of LiDAR and so on and train the model on it. So let me just open up um, these kind of different tools here. If I click on open, my browser will open up multiple pop-ups here. And we will see Gazebo, the Arvis visualization tool, uh, and also the ability to remote control it, which we could obviously simulate with many, many, many different mm -hmm. uh, iterations. Uh, the key point here, as this is loading, you will see that it's exactly the same tools that I'm using on the robot itself with exactly the same protocol. Mm -hmm. And if you look, for example, on my panel here on the left side, those red dots are basically the LiDAR sensor of that simulated environment, right? Mm -hmm. So that simulated robot here detected a wall. Right. Now, what is that wall? If I look at my gazebo client here, you can see if I try to zoom in a little bit here, uh, I just move my environment around a little bit. You can see the robot being here. Always a bit tricky if I don't zoom around properly. <laughs> Get the zoom right on my left side. There. So yeah, whilst you're getting, setting that up, so there basically you set up this uh, environment in the simulation environment. You've got all these obstacles here, so you can set up these many different simulation environments and do the appropriate training. Uh, exactly, yeah. exactly. So you see in the simulation environment here, we got the robot. Uh, if I just zoom out again for one second, you can see that I put it in kind of like a, a virtual kind right. of reception yeah. area here. And so if you look closely, the shape of that reception desk, well, that's exactly that shape of what the laser yeah. sensor now sees here. And if I just make the robot uh, roam around a little bit, so let's say I bring it, uh, I bring it forward a little bit, or oh, actually the other way, uh, let's bring it forward closer to the desk, you can see that my R visualization is updating here too. Uh, if I make it spin around a little bit, you can see that um, the laser sensor information here spins with it. So you can see that our visualization tool is exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so what this allows me now to do is I have a simulation environment, which is this simulated environment here. I get the same kind of information that my actual robot would give me with the same protocols from which I can learn, from which I can inject that into reinforcement learning models. Yeah. I can inject it maybe into SageMaker, et cetera. And then based on that, I train and build my model mm -hmm. and then deploy okay. it out right. uh, to the actual robot. Right. Yeah. Excellent. And the key point obviously being, I can do that at massive scale now yeah. and do many, 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 many iterations without actually me needing to charge the robot and make it drive around uh, all the time. Or you could time. always buy 100,000 yeah. petabots. <laughs> we could do that. I'll let, I'll let you do the assembly of it. Right. There we go. Uh, a lot of screws to assemble there. <laughs> So I think, Dean, overall, you know, it's really interesting to see all the different things that are happening. Yeah. You know, I might have some fun here with a turtle bot, but seeing the possibility of what all the different kinds of machine learning types, uh, reinforcement mm -hmm. learning can do for us, the ability of services that help automate all of this, and then even the fact to just be able to use machine learning services or AI services without the need to really understand how, how it works really enables us uh, 
to make it part of our business. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you have a look just even over the last probably two or three years, just the advancements in this space that's happening. You know, we, sp we spoke about Amazon recognition and image and video uh, analytics um, only two or three years ago, and we thought that was just um, leading, market leading at the time, but you know, being yeah. able to do this with reinforcement learning and simulation environments, you know, opportunities and options are really endless. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I would say, you know, we come to the end of this session. Um, please don't forget uh, to send us your feedback. Thanks for attending this, send us your feedback. Tell us what you think about the different sessions, where you want to see more, where you want to maybe go deeper. Uh, our experts are going to stay around for a while, so please make sure to ask any questions that you might have. Um, any and suggestion for what new demo that Ollie could build for next time? It's absolutely. Always interesting and fascinating demos. Always like the, the new challenges, yeah. and if you happen to attend some of AWS summits, give me ideas on what you would like to see live uh, face to face in person, I'd love to, to build something and show you how it's applicable for your company, your industry, or your market as yeah, such. Thanks for that, Oli. It was really informational and uh, I've learned a lot from that. <laughs> I'm going to be playing with RoboMaker in my turtle. Uh, Thank, right you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dean. <laughs> All right, now to our viewers, uh, please stay online, ask your questions. Thank you very much for staying with us so long and uh, go out there and build great stuff and train machine learning models. Absolutely. Go, Bill.